This is a production of Cornell University. Thank you, Ronnie, for your introduction. And thank you for offering a very nice place for me to study here. OK, uh, hello, everyone. And hello to the guys here at Geneva. Uh, OK, I'm very glad to be here to share with you some interesting stories about Cornell's pump breeding history based on my study here. Uh, I understand that my talk today is very closely related to the previous one of this series, which was given by Dr. Lee Cass on last Tuesday. Dr. Lee Cass talked about the whole history, more than 100 years history, the whole story of Cornell's plant breeding. While my talk today actually is about some episodes in that history and some aspects of, or some background stories, especially in terms of the international involvement of Cornell's plum breeding. Uh, talking about the international involvement of plum breeding here, I think most people will think about a very well-known project conducted by Cornell University Plum Breeding Department and University of Nanking in China. So that project has a very, very long official name here. But from here we can know who are the parties working on that project and where, the, where did the funding come from? But we can easily remember this project as a very short name, the Cornell Nanking story. And most people also think that this story is the beginning of Cornell's international involvement in the field of agriculture, especially to offer the assistance to China's agriculture. But to my findings here, I found the start point should be much earlier. When? As early as 1897. In 1897, the first agriculturist from Cornell going to China, his name is Gerald Brill. He actually was born in New York State. He had a family farm. His family owned a farm at that time. He came to Cornell to study agriculture in 1883, and after five years, he got his bachelor's degree. Then he just went back to his family farm to run that farm. A few years later, he came back again for his graduate study. And also in the year of 1897, when he came back in the same year, he went to China to help with the agricultural work. You may ask, why? Why did he stop his study and go to China? Because that was a very early time. It's really a kind of matter of courage, courage a very courageous trial to do that, right? So the reason why he went there actually should start it from this person. This guy is a very high level or very influential official in China at that time. That was in late Qing dynasty. That dynasty was the last feudalism dynasty in China's history, the late Qing dynasty. At that time, some of the officials or intellectuals realized China needs some reform, especially in the fields of agriculture. So some of them, especially represented by this guy, decided to take some reform or take some trials to, to, to do something on agricultural improvement. One of his trials is to try to establish an agricultural school. Although China has been leading in agriculture for a very, very long time, but that was a kind of traditional agriculture practice. In terms of modern agriculture, he decided to have a school to teach the Chinese people some modern ones, some you know, advanced agricultural practice or technology. Oh, I forgot to talk about his name. His name is Chang Zhidong. He's a viceroy in a province of central China. It's Hubei province of central China. When he decided to open an agriculture school in modern sense, he had to find someone to work for him. Then he turned to several foreigners who were in China at that time for help to find the very right person to do that job. One of the foreigners helped him. His name is Patrick. He was a priest just working in that province at that time. He was a year graduate. But he didn't try to contact his alma mater. 
because he thinks Cornell might be better in agriculture than Yale. So he wrote a letter to Sherman, the third president of Cornell in history. And one more connection between Sherman and China is that after he left the presidency of Cornell here, he was appointed as the ambassador of the United States to the Republic in China. That's a later connection, okay? So Patrick wrote this letter to Sherman, and Sherman gave this letter to Roberts. Roberts was the dean of College of Agriculture then. And he decided Brill might be the best candidate. Why? Because the Viceroy requested that this candidate should know well about modern agriculture. He should have a kind of ability to teach agriculture as well as to run a farm. Just like what I mentioned, Brill had the experience of running a family farm and he learned agriculture here, so he might be the best candidate to go to China. So finally, Brill decided to take the job. Then he went to China. He went to China just in the year of 1897. And after his arrival in China, he signed these contracts with that viceroy. You can see the contracts in English and Chinese languages. And those contracts are still kept in Cornell archives. Very interesting. This, and after one year, I mean in the year 1898, Brill helped that viceroy to establish that agriculture school. And the school began to enroll the first group of students, students in the year of 1898. This is a notice or ask for the enrollment of that agriculture school, also kept in Cornell archives. And also in that year, I mean the first year of the opening of that school, Brill invited another American people, his Cornelian, fellow Cornelian, named Gilmore, to go to China to work as his assistant. So you can see that from this picture, there were two American people with a group of Chinese students. But I should say, unfortunately, they didn't, I mean, they, these two guys didn't stay in China for a long time because they came across a lot of difficulties. For example, one, they too would like to have a piece of field to just build an experiment farm. They had to explain a lot to that viceroy because they will always ask how much money can you make from that farm? Because to Chinese people's at that time, to Chinese people's concept of agriculture, they just think, oh, the farm is just to make money, just to do agricultural production, just to get profit. So they have to explain a lot of times the experimental farm is totally different from the ordinary farm. You cannot count on it to make money. You, they are used for experiment, but they were not understood well. That's one of the difficulties they came across. So just after three or four years, Finally, they too resigned and came back to America. But one thing I would like to mention is that Brill has a very good habit. He kept a very good collection of different kinds of archives. Those archives came to Cornell archives, I mean, after his death. So you, we can still see a lot of pictures and newspapers, letters, a lot of things, different forms in Cornell archives. So those are very valuable, I mean, materials for people who are interested in that part of the history in China's agriculture. You may, you may think, hey, this guy doesn't have anything to do with plant breeding because you're talking about plant breeding in this seminar, right? So the next thing I would like to say is that his connection with plant breeding is that before he went to China, he also visited the USDA, and he got a kind of appointment. He was assigned as a special representative. You can see from uh, this paper. He was assigned as a special representative of USDA to China to do some investigation, to do some you know, collection of the plant resources in China. So that means while he was working for Viceroy, uh, with that agriculture school, he also worked for 
the USDA to collect the plant resources. From the archives, we know, and from the, some, some of the letters he wrote to the USDA, we know that he once collected quite a few different kinds of plant resources and sent them back. The seed, the seedlings, and those things were used later for plant breeding experiments. And one more thing that Brio was connected to plant breeding here is that after he came back to America, he actually had been working on several farms as a manager. From the archives, we know that he kept very close and frequent communication with Dr. Love. I think you may know Dr. Love. He, was, he once was the head of the Department of Plant Breeding here from 1942 to 1949. And Dr. Love actually worked closely with, with Brio, especially he, Dr. Love, did some research or experiment on Brio's farm for, for plant breeding or even for extension work. And Dr. Love, by the way, he was also a very chief participant of the Cornell Nanking story I, I just mentioned at the beginning. Before he decided to go to China, before he decided to, to have that project happen, I mean, the Cornell Nanking story happen, he also wrote the letters to Brio to ask for some suggestions or, or some useful information. So there is another connection between Brio and Cornell's plum breeding. But that's not, my, that's not the main part of my story today because those happened, I mean, Brio went to China. That was in the Qing Dynasty, not in the Republic of China. The Qing Dynasty was followed by the Republic of China. So what I will focus on is a period of the Republic of China. So within the period of Republic of China, not only that was a viceroy, I think more and more people, especially the officials and intellectuals, they began to realize, oh, we must do something on Chinese agriculture. It's, there is a kind of urgent need to improve on Chinese agriculture so that the communication between China and Western nations in terms of agriculture developed very fast in that period, especially the Sino-US communication in agriculture was the fastest growing one. I think this kind of uh, communication took place in two ways. One is the Chinese students came to study in America, especially study agriculture here. The other way is that some, is some American agriculturists, they went to China to offer some help, to offer some instruction there. All right, we can just look at the both of the ways. The first way is the Chinese people coming to America to study agriculture. I'm not trying to glorify Cornell, but I think talking about Sino-US communication in in agriculture, Cornell should be the one to be named at the first. You can see from the number, from 1912 to 1927, altogether there were 170 students from China. They came to study in America for agriculture. Among them, 40 came to Cornell. <coughs> that was the biggest group compared with the students to other universities. And in the following 10 years, 190 students were sent by Chinese government to study agriculture here. And one third of them choose Cornell as their university. Compared with the other, the students to other universities, Michigan, Illinois, still the biggest group. So you can see Cornell is a very, the first choice for the students to study agriculture at that time. And among all the Chinese students coming here, this guy should be named, and I'm not sure whether you know Chinese people or American people know this guy very, very well. His name is Hu Xu. Dr. Hu Xu actually graduated from Cornell, and he was considered as a key contributor to China's language reform and liberalism. What's the connection between him and agriculture? Actually, this guy was originally sent to Cornell to study agriculture. But later, 
he thought, oh, I'm not quite interested in that. I don't like that. So he changed his major to philosophy and literature. And he later worked as a minister of education in Republic of China. And one more thing interesting that is that this guy also, I, he's a very talented guy. He also took part in the English speaking context of Cornell. He beated all the American students who speak English as a native language and got a first prize. So yeah, very interesting, but very talented people. So besides Hu Shi, actually, there are quite a few very outstanding agriculturists in the period of Republican China. Actually, they graduated from Cornell. Then they went back to serve their country. All right, let's look at the other side, the other direction. The American people, agriculturists, going to China. We should name this one. His name is John Lawson Buck. He was a Cornelian, went to China in 1910s or something. Actually, he was the very person who established the first department of agriculture economics in China, just in the University of Nanking. And also, he's the very person who conducted the first investigation or research on rural economy and farm management in China. So he was considered actually a kind of father of the discipline of agricultural economics in China, very influential. Still remembered by people, I mean, doing agricultural uh, economics in China today, but maybe also to, China, uh, to American people. Uh, one more thing about him is that he got married with Pearl Buck. This lady was a daughter of a priest in China then. This lady actually was born in China and grew up in China, so she spoke very good Chinese as well as English. While after their marriage, she just went together with, with Dr. Buck to do those investigations in rural areas and mainly just worked as a translator or interpreter. And later, Pearl Buck wrote a novel named The Good Earth, based on his, her experience, which is a kind of a very vivid and good portrayal of Chinese rural life in history. And because of that novel, this lady was awarded the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1938. Maybe you will think, hey, you should go to Warren Hall to talk about, to talk about these guys, because we are still doing plum breeding here, right? So uh, the connection between this guy and plum breeding China is that the person invited him to work in the University of Nanking was John Henry Reisner. That's the main story I will talk about today. I will talk about this guy, his life, his work, his contributions in terms of plum breeding to, Chinese, to China's agriculture. Before I talk about Reisner, I would like to have a few words on the University of Nanking and the College of Agriculture, because at that time, he worked as a dean of the College of Agriculture in that university. From here, we can see the University of Nanking was founded in, was founded in, nine, in 1888. Actually, it was a private university sponsored by American churches here. And it was proud to be the first educational institution in China, officially named as university in English. Before that, most of the I mean, institutions were called schools or something, not the university. This was the first one to use university as an English name. And it was once, it once uh, registered with the New York State Education Department. What does that mean? That means the students graduate from that university. They could come directly to any university here in New York State without taking any additional test. Their academic achievement will be approved and, and accepted here. And the College of Agriculture in that university was one of the strongest college. It was considered as, it was actually the first institute in China to offer four-year bachelor degree education in field of agriculture. 
so that it was considered, I mean, the establishment of that college was considered as a beginning of China's modern higher education in agriculture. Very meaningful step. And that college later evolved into the current Nanjing Agricultural University. That's a university I'm now working with, so that's why I'm here. I'm quite interested in, in this part of the story. Okay, so I think one of the reasons why the College of Agriculture is very strong is that it once got involved in the Cornell Nanking project, Cornell Nanking story project. Okay, is that a stop request here? <laughs> okay, all right. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, that's the reason why the college was very strong. Just because of that project, those faculty were, get, were trained by the American experts and the research, research ability were improved. Or, you know, a lot of results achieved from that project. Okay. Then I will just go on to talk about the Reisner, uh, the, the guy Reisner. You can see from here, I, if you are interested in, in that story, I would recommend you to have a look of this book. It can be downloaded from online now. You can see from here, actually, this book was co-authored by two persons, Reisner and Dr. Le. I think, yeah, this is a Chinese version. We just translated and published it in China. I got involved in translation. So yeah, I like this story. Those are the two authors. I think compared with Dr. Love, Reisner also did a very great job in that history, in that project. But he was not remembered as much as Dr. Love. So that's why I would like to give you more stories and things about Reisner today. And first, we should know how significant this person is. From the Cornell alumni news, from a new story, it was once said to be perhaps the foremost graduate performing outstanding service to agriculture by Cornell in China. And here is a buyer sketch of this person. Although actually he did mostly, he did a lot of, I mean, mission work, religious service in other developing nations, but he also did a lot of agricultural work. So I still think that he is an agriculturist. He was born in Virginia and grew up in Pennsylvania. He went to Ear College in 1907. And after four years, he got a bachelor's degree in arts. Just remember, he got a degree in arts, not in agriculture. And later, just because of his contribution to agriculture mission work, I'm not sure whether you're familiar with agriculture mission work. Actually, in the history, some American churches, they, they wish to combine the mission work and agricultural services together so that the churches can partic participate more in those rural area services and to increase their influence in those developing nations. So actually, he devoted most of his life to the agricultural mission work. Then he was awarded the honorary degree of Master of Arts in 1950 by his alma mater, Yale University. Okay, the Yale College actually was the undergraduate college of Yale University in history. And yeah, he died in New York State. He mostly, yeah, he did most of the agricultural mission work. After he came back, he came back from China uh, in 1931. After he came back, he basically worked with this organization and he also, in 1950s, he once worked as the observer for various church agencies with FAO. And also, he was a member of the advisory committee of the Technical Cooperation Administration. That's a, that was also called the Point Four program in history, recommended by, by President Truman in American history, just mainly focusing on having some cooperation, technical cooperation with other developing nations. All right. So that's why he was also related to President Truman's Point Four program. You may still have this question. He was a year graduate, a Bachelor of Arts. How did he turn to do agricultural plant breeding? How was he connected with plant breeding? So actually, the story 
started from this movement, the student volunteer movement of foreign missions, because he graduated from EO in 1911. That was just the peak time of the student volunteer movement of foreign mission. Thousands of college students graduated from university. Then they went to other nations to do some religious service full of passion. And Reisner was one of them. And from the oral history, and also I tried, I tried to contact the descendants of, 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 of Reisner and his granddaughter offered me some very valuable information and, and documents. From those part of the, from those materials, I got to know that after he graduated from Yale, he was firstly offered a job to teach biology in University of Nanking because that university was sponsored by American churches here, right? So he was actually a mathematics major in Yale. And he thought, maybe I cannot teach biology very well. At that time, he got to know that the College of Agriculture will be established in the University of Nanking. He thought, hey, I'm more interested in teaching agriculture because I once did some agriculture while I was young because he helped you know, to do some farm work while he was young. But he still didn't think that he has got enough preparation to teach agriculture to China. Then he just came to Cornell in 1912 to attend some summer school courses. That experience really opened the eyes of Reisner to the modern agriculture and advanced agriculture. Then he decided to go on. He came back in 1913 to register for his master's degree. And under, uh, yeah, his major was farm crops and his minor was just plum breeding under the Professor Gilbert. He was also a member of the plum breeding department's synapsis club. Dr. Lee talked about this club last week. It's a club for the plum breeding faculty and students to meet regularly to have dinners, to have social lives, to even have seminars. All right, so from this picture, we can see this young gentleman was Reisner and his professor Gilbert was sitting at the front row. Yeah, actually, just in one year, he finished all the required courses for his master's degree. That means he finished his courses in 1914. But he didn't have enough time to finish his thesis. Then he had to go. He had to go to, to leave for China. Actually, he finished his thesis in China while he was working in the University of Nanking. His thesis is about the wheat history, the, the, the wheat planting history in New York State. And also, he got his master's degree in the year of 1915 while he was in Nanjing. Yeah, Nanjing is the, the current name. The, uh, the, the city used to be called Nanking, but now it's called Nanjing. Okay, so yeah, before he went to China, he got to know a girl named Bertha Betts, that girl was a, also a student in a major of home economics in the same college. And before he went to China, he decided to take her together with, with him to go to China. Then the girl agreed. They just went together. Okay. Yeah, while they were in China, mostly, most of the time, from, uh, I mean, upon his arrival, in two years, Reisner was was working on the faculty at the University of Nanking in the College of Agriculture. And for the rest, more than 10 years, he worked as a dean or co-dean because for political reasons, sometimes they have to, uh, you know, carry out a system of the coding <coughs> with the Chinese people working as another coding so that they, they were not, you know, rejected by Chinese people just for some period of time in history. So he worked as a dean or coding for more than 15 years. Yeah, something about his wife, Mrs. Reisner, also did something while he, she was in Nanjing. He developed a cookbook. The purpose of the, this cookbook is to teach those non-Chinese people who were living at China to use some food stuff grown locally to cook some dishes. And that book was actually published in, also in English and, and Chinese 
also you can get a copy from Cornell archives. Okay, if, if you want to have a look of this book. All right, let's go back to Reisner's story. Uh, to Reisner's uh, oral history and to the literature I found, actually Reisner was the second person in China who had a master's degree in either, in either agriculture or in forestry. The first guy was a Chinese person. He graduated from Michigan State University and majoring in forestry. Then he went back earlier than Reisner. But in the University of Nanking, he was the first person on the faculty with any training in agriculture. Considering the University of Nanking was very leading in agriculture at that time in China, so you can see that Reisner's work might be very pioneering or forerunning in China, especially to China's agriculture and plant breeding. Okay, so Reisner record almost anything that one did in China at that time was a first very meaningful and significant. And Reisner felt that his most notable achievement that he made in China was definitely in crop breeding and improvement. So to my understanding, or my story, we'll talk about his work in China just by, by two parts. One part of his contribution is that he institute, instituted the Cornell Nanking story that we just mentioned. I, later I will give you more background information on this story. The other part of his achievements is that he did some personal trial on plant breeding experiments and also got success in that period. Very meaningful thing. Very early, just upon his arrival in 1914, he just started to, to do something on plant breeding. He might be the first person to, 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 to have brought the modern technology of plant breeding to China and to use that. Okay, those are something from his oral history. Actually, from here we know that he did plant breeding mainly on two crops. One is on wheat, and the other one is on corn or maize. All right, so he said he de developed the first pure string of wheat from a single plant and had a very good yield. And that variety was used as a Czech variety for a period of time. And for the corn, he also developed a Chinese yellow corn from selections. And that corn also was proved to be very successful in some parts of China. Let's look at the wheat first. The wheat, actually, to Chinese literature, that wheat was named as a number 26, developed by Reisner. And here is a table from a report of Myers. Myers, Dr. Myers was also one of the participants in Cornell Nanking story. He worked in China for, set, uh, for a period of time. Before he left, he just submitted a report on his work in China. In that report, we can see this table. You can see that here, the standard variety is number six. Number six is used as a standard variety. And it, had, it has got a better yield than those average farm varieties. And in terms of the corn, the corn that he developed was named as a Nanking yellow. He developed this corn by year to row method. That was a, actually this method was already commonly used in American experiment stations, but the first time to be used in China. And it was proved to be very, very successful, especially in the area of Yangtze River. So from those successful experiences, Reisner has got more confidence in doing plant breeding in China. He said, increased agricultural production in China will come most easily and quickly through increasing yield by scientific plant selection. Okay, that, those, are the, those are some of his personal trials in plant breeding. And the second part of his contribution is about the Cornell Nanking story. I would like to give you some background stories about this one. So actually, the Cornell Nanking story started because a serious famine in the Huai River, that's central China, Huai River, in 1920s. Then President Wilson set up a committee by responding to, to uh, responded to that famine, ser serious famine by setting up a committee to raise a big sum of money to do the famine relief work. 
But later, that relief work ended sooner or earlier than expected. The committee found that they still have a very big sum of money not used. How could they use this money in a very wise way, very wide way, or very effective way? Then Reisner just at that time got to the news, got, got to know the news, and he submitted a proposal to that committee saying that this money could be used in a long run famine prevention instead of a short run famine relief work, especially that could be used in agriculture. Then that proposal was approved. The College of Agriculture got $750,000. That's really a very big sum of money. Then that's why the Cornell Nanking story happened. But the next, for, next step for Reisner to, to do is to design a concrete scheme or, or design what really he needs to do with that money. Then he designed a very comprehensive project, especially in the field of plant breeding, because we mentioned he has got a lot of confidence in plant breeding. Then he chose plant breeding as a main work of the design project. He then, in 1924, he wrote to Dr. Love at plant breeding here to discuss on the possibility to invite some American experts to come to China to work and cooperate on plant breeding. So in brief, that project finally involved three experts from Cornell plant breeding. They just went to China in turn, each one being there for for one year, but each one of them just went to China twice, each time one year there. They did a lot of things in China. They taught lessons, they taught, you know, gave lectures, they instructed the experiment, they helped with the extension work, they did a lot of things. You can see that, you know, actually it's a kind of transferring of the land ground mode, land ground college mode from Cornell to, to University of Nanking, especially the College of, of Agriculture there. So just because it's a very comprehensive project, the result achieved from the project is also very comprehensive. The less people were trained, the high yield crops were achieved, and the method was standardized. A lot of achievements were, were got from that very successful Cornell Nanking story project. And one more thing about this project, I mean the long lasting effect of that project is that it was commonly considered as a first notable example of international technical cooperation in agriculture. So that's why it's also related to the recommendation for President Truman for US government's point four program. That's a technical cooperation program. And also with, this, with the success of the Cornell Nanking story, there is a following success of the Cornell Los Banyer story. All right, uh, some comment from, you know, the other people on Reisner's work and contribution in China. This guy, this person is Dr. Shen Zonghan. He is a very outstanding plant breeder in China's uh, agricultural history, especially in the period of the Republic in China. But he went to Taiwan, uh, you know, during the time of communi uh, communist China. Uh, he did a lot of contribution, not only to China's agriculture, but also to agriculture of Southeast Asia. He was a student of Dr. Love. He was also a Canadian graduate. He once, uh, in, in the year of 1935, he once made a speech talking about the development of China's plum breeding creole. He made the reflection that China's plum breeding started from 1915. The first 10 years was just like the, a person's childhood. And in the year of 1925, it was tra transferred or tra transited to a kind of person's childhood. Uh, I'm sorry, a teenager, teenager years. Okay, the first 10 years and second 10 years, different period. And you can see from the timing, the starting, the, ori the origin of China's plum breeding actually is about the time while Reisner just arrived in China and started his trial in plum breeding. And the transition year is also the time Reisner started and instituted 
that well-known Cornell Nanking story project. So both stages are very closely related to this guy. And Dr. Shen also named several representative persons for the two stages of China's you know, starting years of plum breeding. And Reisner was named respectively for the two stages. Okay, finally, some epilogue for my talk today. Uh, I, I, although I focus on Reisner's contribution to China's agriculture, to China's plum breeding, but we should always remember that it's never a one-way traffic. It's always a win-win project. Only in this way can such kind of cooperation be very successful and sustainable. For example, Cornell staff and students may get a very global vision from such kind of experience. They may, uh, yeah, they may have more knowledge of the, the situation in different areas of, of, uh, on the world. And besides that, they also can have some valuable plant resources I mean, in history from such kind of cooperation. One very good example is about Dr. Love and his warm body story, which was, was also told in Dr. Love's book, The Cornell Nanking Story. Okay, in brief, the warm barley is a barley variety brought by Dr. Love from China to, to America. He used that in plant breeding experiment and later that, that variety was used for extension and got a very big profit for New York wheat industry. And the variety was named as warm barley just because the Chinese assistant working with, 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 with Love while he was in China or the person who firstly saw that variety, his name, his last name was Wang. So that was why it was named as Wang Barley. All right, since you know, it's always a kind of mutually beneficial project. So even nowadays, I still think there are much, it's much easier or there are more opportunities than before to make such kind of win-win project happen in current time or in the future. Maybe even not only, maybe not only just beneficial to the two parties of the cooperation, but even beneficial to the global agriculture. So if you have not visited China, if you have not worked with Nanjing Agriculture University, come on, now it's a chance. <laughs> so I think a new Cornell Nanking story is just waiting for you to institute and participate. I'm very glad to be the, the liaison person or to offer some information that you're interested. Okay, that's all for my talk. Thank you very much. I would like to thank these persons and uh, some of the institutions who just helped me uh, with my study, one year study here. And if you have any questions, just I'm very glad to, to answer that. So we have time for a few questions. In those early days, was uh, language, the language barrier a major problem or uh, did any of the US people speak Chinese or did any speak English? Uh, I think uh, language barrier is always a problem, but that's not the biggest problem. Uh, those, uh, those American people, they went to China. They, they, I, I, don't, I don't think they, they learned much Chinese, but Chinese people, maybe they mostly, the Chinese people just help to translate or they speak, they spoke China, uh, English very well so that they can just work together with, with those American people there. Nowadays, I think things are much better. <laughs> Chinese people maybe speak I think they, they, more and more Chinese people speak better English. So if you want to go there, don't worry about language. <laughs> Thank you for your question. Is there any information about the Chinese students who came to Cornell and then went to the early days, whether they found it was a big culture shock, or what their experience was like coming to Cornell in the early days? Yes, uh, yes, that's actually uh, from those early archives of those Chinese students coming here, especially I just mentioned Dr. Hu Shi. Actually, there also is, there's also a kind of huge box of papers about him, not, not uh, Hu Shi. Uh, those papers are not kept by Hu Shi, but kept uh, a, a lady who was American people. She hosted Hu Shi in her family. Mm -hmm. 
he kept a very good collection of different kind of papers about this person. And from those papers, we can find very interesting stories uh, while those students just came in and how they settled down, how they got used to the culture here. And a very interesting thing is that also Hu Shi's mother, a very, also intellectual in China, she wrote a letter to the American lady to show her appreciation, but of course in Chinese. And who should translate that in very, very good English. I really admire his English, actually. <laughs> yeah, just like the English people wrote, wrote that letter. I think after a few years here, who should just got used to, I mean, the culture and the, 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 the environment here, and he did very well. Please. Mm -hmm. So Nanjing is famous, or sadly so, for what happened during the Japanese occupation. Yes. What happened to the university and the College of Agriculture during that period? Yes, uh, that's a good question. During that period, most of the college students were moved, they have to move to the southwest of China. So actually during, I mean, within the history of our university, there was one part that the university was based in another province in China. But there were still some foreigners. They stayed in America because, uh, stayed in Nanjing because, you know, they are American people, they're foreigners. They were a little bit different from the Chinese people. The Japanese invaders, they, they maybe, they, they are not, you know, do anything easily on them. So there are, I remember there was one uh, American people, his name's Riggers, and he actually is uh, in the field of agricultural engineering. He also got some funding and sponsor from Cornell in China Club because at that time there was a kind of organization named Cornell in China Club. The club is just to promote the communication between Cornell and China. Uh, the, the club just offered some funding to, to that American people to do some teaching and research in China. He was a very important, important person to work in a kind of safe zone to protect a lot of Chinese people who left and you know, who didn't leave, in, in, who, did, who didn't run away in, in Nanjing at that time. That's very interesting, touching story. Thank you for the question. What happened to the university during the Cultural Ah, yes, you might be interested in that. Okay, that's a very interesting story. During the Cultural Revolution, you know, the Chairman Mao at that time, he thought that the agricultural university, they should go to the rural area so that they can be very close to agriculture. Then those agricultural universities, all of them just moved to very rather remote or rural area, very small county or something like that. Uh, I should say the research, the teaching were actually interrupted because of, you know, you know, that at that time, most of the, you know, there was always a kind of chaos in the society. So the student teacher, they cannot, you know, have a very good environment to study and do research. So yeah, they were moved out of the city, but after the revolution, uh, cultural revolution, most of them, all of them just came back. Yeah, our, my university was also moved to a very small city, not far from the Nanjing, but in 1981, it was moved back to the city of Nanjing. Any other questions? Just out of curiosity, how many people in this room have been to China? Yes. Oh, oh that's great. That's much more than my expectation. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so what about the rest ones? <laughs> Would you like to go there? If yes, okay, so. That's my purpose <laughs> of, of, my, of giving the talk today. Thank you, Thank you okay. very much for your time. This has been a production of Cornell University on the web at cornell.edu.